My name is Tyler Torres. I'm 17 years old, and God has been doing some amazing things in my life over this last year. One of the things he's been teaching me about is identity, and I struggled with this question growing up of, you know, who am I? My mom left me at a young age, you know, she was a drug addict, so I really was, was searching for, you know, who I was, and I, and I went to the world for answers, and I, I was searching and searching, and I, Everything that everything that I found, everything that I did, it was all it was all empty. There was no purpose. I was still I was still the same broken kid that I was. And then I found I found God. I came to the relaunch. Pastor G preached a great sermon, spoke right to me. And God God just said, I can heal you. I can heal you. I can give you purpose. I can give you identity. I can give you what you've been searching for for so long. And then God touched me, completely healed me. And now I get my identity from Christ, you know, like, ah, woo, I get passionate, sorry. And like, okay, we can cut that, right? Awesome. Future world changer, we will never cut the passion out. <laughs> so now that I know, like, my identity comes from Christ, it doesn't come from my past, it doesn't come from my background, how I grew up, it comes from what God says about me and what his word says about me. I am called, I am anointed, I am, I am not who I was, I am not who I am. Now I have purpose in Christ because what he did for me, because he was able to love me right where I was at, and that is where I find my identity, and that is where everyone should find their identity because there's no purpose in this world. The world is not gonna give you what you're looking for, what your heart really desires, and, and what your heart really desires is God and, the, and, and what he can give you, the purpose he can give you, he can give you identity. My name is Madison Hill and I'm 18 years old. In this past season, God has really been showing me how important the mind is. There's so many voices that influence our thoughts and God's really been showing me how important it is to find His and listen to His above all others. Personally, I struggle with being hard on myself, but God shows me to fill myself with what He says I am. And I go off of that and I strive off the good things in my life because God shows me that there's more to life than just being down and hard on myself. Because he shows me how great I can be and he shows me that in his, in his kingdom, I am a child of God and I am sorry. Sorry, this makes me so emotional. I think that's why I'm like getting so overwhelmed. Sorry. So God shows me that I'm a child of God and he shows me that I am worth everything that he says I am. And he shows me all of his promises and he shows me that I'm gonna be a, a great woman of the kingdom of God. And he gives me comfort and he fills me with peace and, and, and confidence. So I wanna go out there and share with my generation and my family and the people that need it. I wanna go and share my, my testimonies and, and, the, and the battles that I went through and help them and show and just glorify God in the way that he's been working in my life. My name is Presley Manning and I'm 14 years old. I really feel like God is saying to me to be the first one because this generation needs to be the generation of first. We need to be the one that stands up for everyone else because right now in our society with social media, there's so many distractions everywhere and there's so many things that we want to do that don't matter because we're on this earth for a short amount of time compared to the eternity that we're in in heaven. And if we're so busy and caught up in thinking about how our life is on earth, we're going to completely miss the huge picture that we're on here equipping us for how we're going to bring people to Jesus and we're going to have an eternity with Him. It only takes one match to light up a room. You can be that person. You can be that person to stand up and everyone be like, hey, yeah, she's right. Whatever God is asking you to do, go for it, grab it, touch it, because that is, it's so fulfilling. And it's such an amazing feeling to be in the presence of God and to feel Him and to have Him speak to you. So back to school Sunday. As you can see, God is doing some amazing things in the next generation. And I'm so proud of these students. They're actually all here right now, Presley, Maddie, and Tyler. We're so proud of you guys. Um, truthfully, truthfully, though, those are three of many stories that we could tell. My name's Jeffrey Graff, if you don't know me. I'm the pastor of the Youth and Young Adults. And I say this all the time, but I believe I have the best job in the world because I get to pastor the best people in the world. We relaunched a year ago, and I, didn't, I don't think I was prepared for how much the youth and young adults of this church would really have my heart. So uh, if y'all would give them a hand clap, because they're amazing. Um, I don't know if y'all know them, but y'all got some of the best in the world. Also, 
I need to embarrass one more group of people. If you serve with me back in the next gen, in any capacity, youth or young adults, please stand up right now. I was calling people out by name last night, like Miss Jessica, so I said, get, get up. Yeah! <laughs> That is my squad. I just got to show them some love. What we do doesn't happen without them. And of course, um, our, our lead pastors. Y'all don't get to hear the conversations that I have on the phone with my parents. But man, they care about the next generation so much. And what we do is only even possible because they were brave enough to lead the way and listen to God's voice. So let's pay honor where honors do there as well. Uh, well. Well, let me tell you what gets me most excited about the video we watched. Over the last couple of years, I've experienced firsthand heart change which is awesome because a lot of times, especially in youth ministry, I admit it, we are guilty of bringing a lot of hype, but not necessarily a lot of heart change. Don't get me wrong. I love hype. I love fun. I love entertainment. Shameless plug. September 16th, if you come to the back to school bash, it's about to go down. It's going to be hype. You're going to be like, is that safe? And I'm going to be like, mm-hmm. It's going to be amazing. Um, just kidding. It'll be safe. I promise. But I love hype. But when I took over the next gen department, I really wanted to see Jesus work on some young people's hearts. I wanted to see them overcome addictions, walk in, walk in a godly confidence, and really get a hold of their fear and anxiety, teach them who they were in Christ. Because I know a lot of people, and there's just people in general, that the words they would use to describe church, they would say things like, yeah, the church is really cool. The church is fun. The church is entertaining. But when you look at their heart, their heart's not necessarily a heart that's producing a life that's really sold out for Christ, living the way he wants him to live. I love fun. I love hype. I love all of that. But I guess I know its limits. It doesn't necessarily change your heart. And something happened to me when I was 21 years old that forever will change the way I view the spectacular and even the miraculous. When I was 21 years old, I went to Uganda, Africa, and there was this Muslim woman there who was blind. And so I go over to her. I say, ma'am, um, would you mind if I play, pray for your eyes in the name of Jesus Christ? And so she says, yes, that's fine. So I pray for her eyes. And I don't want you to think this normally happens when I pray, because it doesn't. But out of nowhere, her eyes just start watering. I wish I could say, like, oh, I was expecting, I was like, it worked? What the heck? <laughs> <laughs> and she starts opening her eyes, and she can see for the first time. And I'm, like, on cloud nine, and I step up, and I start preaching the gospel. I say, ma'am, Jesus Christ heals your eyes, but he wants to heal more than your eyes. He wants to heal your heart. So do you know that we're all sinners, saved by grace, that Jesus really gave everything he had for you so that he could be the Lord and Savior of his life? Will you please accept him as Lord and Savior of your life? She looked at me tears in her eyes and she said no <laughs> I was like oh I'm about to have to pray for my ears because I heard you say no and she said I'm a Muslim do you understand the risk that, that would put myself in the strain it would put on the relationship with my husband and my family it was really cool to see God do that but cool things don't change hearts now let me say miracles. Yeah, we should want miracles. We should believe in miracles. Miracles are amazing so long as miracles do the work of a sign and wonder. A sign points you to Christ, right? So I love miracles, but more than anything, more than the hype, more than the lights that show the sound, I want to know what changes a heart. So today I want to preach a message to you called Beyond Hype. Everybody say Beyond Hype. I already stated the problem. Hype can't change your heart. But let me prove it from the Bible because a man named Elijah, he experienced this firsthand. Elijah was a prophet. He spoke on behalf of God to the nation of Israel way before Jesus was even alive. And Elijah prophesied during a time where the people of Israel were so far from God. God used to be the official God of Israel's religion, but at this point in time, the official God of Israel's religion was a God named Baal. And Elijah's tired of it. In fact, three and a half years before the text we're going to read today, Elijah prays that the country would experience a drought, no rain. Why does he do that? Because Baal, that god, was supposed to be the god of rain. So Elijah steps up on the scene. And he's like, I'll show you who really controls the rain. No rain. Boom. Sprinkler shut off. It happens. Three and a half years. No rain. Famine. Obviously, people hate Elijah. But he comes back three and a half years, and they're still worshiping Baal. So he's like had it up to here. And then he, he I love him because he's relatable, right? If we're trying to prove who's more powerful, who's stronger, who's this, who's that, what do we do? We let him fight, right? So he's like, let's go. Your God versus my God, meet me on the mountain. It's going down. 
Meet me at the mall. Remember that song? It's going down. Rico bet me I couldn't slip that into a sermon somehow. Boom. Owe me five bucks, Rico. Um, so he does. It's a fight. It's a contest. Joe Rogan was there. That's not true. But it was this contest to say, okay, here's the objective. Whoever can call down fire from heaven and consume the altar, that is the true God of Israel. So the prophets of Baal, they go first. They're praying to Baal. Nothing happens. Elijah is so much like us, y'all. He starts talking mess. He's like, your God's probably off peeing or something. He literally says that. I'm not, the Bible translates it relieving himself. But it means your God's taking a leak. What's going on? You know what I mean? That's what happens. So Elijah steps on the scene. And he prays to God instantly. Fire from heaven consumes the altar. The heat is so great it consumes everything around and people fall to their knees. They say, okay, the, the Lord is God. Elijah's not done there. He goes and he kills all the prophets of Baal. And then he's like, all right, I proved my point. I proved my point. It can rain again. And the clouds start swelling and we pick up his story. You can imagine, he's on cloud nine. This is crazy. 1 Kings 18, 45 through 46, though, it says, And soon the sky was black with clouds. A heavy wind brought a terrific rainstorm. And Ahab, the king, left quickly for Jezreel, the, the city's capital. Then the Lord gave special strength to Elijah. He tucked his cloak into his belt and ran ahead of Ahab's chariot all the way to the entrance of Jezreel. Now let me stop there. Because Elijah's an outlaw. This man is probably one of the most hated people in Israel. He's responsible for the three and a half year drought and famine. People hate him. There is a bounty on this guy's head and he's been in hiding. But now all of a sudden you see this man strolling into broad daylight, the capital city. Why? What changed? Well, he thought he won. <laughs> he thought he was going to show up to the capital, and the king and the queen were either going to be like, you're right, the Lord is God, or at the bare minimum, the people are going to rise up and be like, yeah, we want God back. He gets there. After all the hype, after all the show, and look what happens. First Kings 19, 2 through 3, and Jezebel, the queen, she sent this message to Elijah. May the gods strike me and even kill me, if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you killed them, the prophets of Baal. Elijah was afraid, and he fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. Elijah can't believe it. After all of that, he leaves, he runs, he leaves his servant. As a prophet, he got a servant. So essentially, he fired his staff. He let him go. He was ready to quit the ministry after all the spectacular and even the miraculous. Nothing changed their heart. Elijah had to learn the problem. Hype can't change your heart. We don't always think like this. We often will ask things or say things like, man, if we could see more miracles, oh, then people would really believe in God. I mean, those are good, but that's not necessarily true. Or we'll look for hype in other ways. Oh, if we could bring more fun, better lights, this, that, or the other, more energy. We could get more kids into youth service. Okay, but more kids in a seat doesn't necessarily mean more hearts transformed for Christ. We can see this even in Jesus' own ministry. In Matthew eleven twenty, it says, Then Jesus began to denounce the towns where he had done so many of his miracles. Why? Because they hadn't repented of their sins and turned to God. Jesus did miracles. It was awesome, but the people didn't give their life to God. Here's the problem. Hype doesn't always change your heart. So what does? Well, it's ironic, because yeah, Israel's heart desperately needed to be changed, but so did Elijah's. God did not meet Elijah's expectations, and the next time we see him, his faith crumbles. He is running away. He actually prays, God, will you just kill me now? And so God has to tenderly care for Elijah until Elijah's strong enough to go face the thing he's running from. And in doing so, in caring for Elijah like that, God shows us how he really changes a heart. So let's talk about how a heart changes. The story continues. Elijah's depressed and he's running away. I'm excited about this first point because it's so practical. But look at how awesome God is. He's all sad taters over there, Elijah is. And God just comes, meets him, sends an angel of the Lord. And look at the first thing God does for him. You ready for this? 1 Kings 19, 5 through 8. Then Elijah laid down and slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. 
He looked around, and there beside his head was some bread, baked on hot stones in a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. Then the angel of the Lord came and touched him and said, Get up and eat some more, or the journey is going to be too much for you. So he got up, ate and drank, and the food gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. There he came to a cave where he spent the night. But the Lord said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah is down and depressed. And what is the first thing God does for him? He cooks food. That is the God I serve. <laughs> he says, mijo, wake up and eat some migas. It'll be okay. <laughs> it's amazing. I'm serious. God sends an angel, and the angel touches him, cooks for him, asks him to sleep. God even asks him, what are you doing, Elijah? Not because God needs information, but God's given him this chance to process life and just sit there and think. What we see here is a God who's so wise. He takes care of us on every single front, physical, emotional, psychological, and yes, eventually spiritual. That's the climax of the whole passage. But I got to point this out real quick because it's so significant. The first thing God does in this process of caring for Elijah's heart is he shows he has a holistic view of life. And we desperately need this. A lot of times people will camp out like in the area they want to camp out. So like if you're depressed, it's automatically like, where are you sinning? <laughs> you know, or like what thoughts have whatever. And that might be part of it. That could be a very important part of it. Other people camp out in this other space where everything's so physical, emotional, psychological, they don't even see a need for God. If you're so depressed, oh, that's fine. You just need to sleep it off. Go eat something. Talk it out. Take a pill. It'll be okay. But the God of the universe is so wise. If you didn't believe in Jesus, did you know he was this wise? That he cares about every aspect of life as creator and redeemer of all aspects of life, he shows the need for a holistic view of life. Sometimes the most spiritual thing you can do for yourself or you can do for other people is just treat them like a whole person. Sometimes you need a Bible right away. Other times you need a bite to eat right away. Some migas right away. Hey, listen, I'm preaching today. I'm finishing another message tomorrow. Uh, Tuesday I'm preaching again, Wednesday I'm preaching again, Thursday I got to go start next week's message and go for a full day of work. But this week I'm also celebrating two years of marriage with my wife. Thank you. Super easy for me, quite an accomplishment for her. So on Friday I'm going to the beach. If you call me, I will not answer your phone call. Why? Because even pastors know we're not just spiritual beings. We have to care about life holistically. We got to take life from every aspect if we're really going to have a healthy heart that's responding to God. And let me say this real quick. I love that, the, that God sent the angel of the Lord to do this part. Because there are some things that only God can do. At the very end of this passage, you'll see God could only do that. But God sent the angel to do this part. Why? Well, Anybody could cook for you. Anybody could listen to you. Anybody could let you process stuff. Anybody could give you a hug. Anybody could check up on you, make sure you're sleeping all right. Let me make it a little more personal for you. You want to know a really good first step to caring about the people God put in your life, the family that you want to see come to know them, the friends that you want to know the love of Christ. Well, you could cook for them. You could give them a hug. You could call them, make sure they're sleeping all right. You could ask them questions, give them a chance to process life. And yes, you could pray for them and you could invite them to church. Those are great things to do too. But caring for a person holistically is one of the most spiritual things you could do. This is a very practical point, but God thought it was important to put it in here, so I thought it was important to put it in here too, amen? The God of the Bible, he's so incredible. He had important spiritual stuff to do, you'll see. But the first step to taking care of Elijah's heart was to view life holistically. See, the story continues, and if you read, you see one of the reasons Elijah is so down and depressed is because he genuinely, genuinely, genuinely thought he knew God's plan. And I can't blame him. I would have too. He's like, God, we stopped the rain. We called down the fire. And then we sent the rain back, and it still didn't work. And he's down and depressed, and God asks him, what are you doing? And his response to God kind of shows you where his head's at. Elijah says in 1910, Elijah replied, I have zealously served the Lord God. But the people of Israel have broken their covenant with you, torn down your altars, killed every one of your prophets. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me. 
Translation. I have zealously served the Lord God Almighty. I did my part. <laughs> uh -uh. I executed the plan perfectly, God. Sent down fire, stopped rain. This one, big guy, this one's on you. I don't know what to do. But God was teaching Elijah something. Listen, when the Bible says stuff, like God's ways are not our ways, it very, very seriously means that. See, Elijah's plan failed. God's plan did not fail. God did not expect all of this lights and show and fire and rain to change hearts. No, God had another plan. He told Elijah in verse 15 through 19, this was God's plan, warning you, not super impressive, but it says this, then the Lord God told him, go back the same way you came and travel to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive there, anoint Hazael to be the king of Aram. Then anoint Jehu, grandson of Nimshi, these are all terrible names, to be king of Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Snapchat, from the town of Abel Mahola, to replace you as my prophet. Y'all listen to me. Anyone who escapes from Hazael will be killed by Jehu, and those who escape Jehu will be killed by Elisha. Yet I'll preserve 7,000 others in Israel who've never bowed to Baal or kissed him. God had a plan, but Elijah was dead set on his own. And please hear me, when you really want God's will, but you insist that it be done your way, you are going to have an unhealthy heart. In other words, God knew for Elijah to have a heart change. He didn't just need to have a holistic view of life. He needed to hold fast to God's sovereignty. Listen, there are times in life God's plan will make zero sense to you. That doesn't mean he's not working. On paper, this plan that I just read, to be truthful, it wasn't like the best plan in the world. For starters, Hazael, the king that God said to go anoint, he was an ungodly, pagan person. There is no evidence ever that he gave his life to Jesus, that he was a believer. Even Jehu, the one he said to go anoint as the king over Israel, he did some stuff, but at the end of his life, he got condemned for not bringing idolatry to a close. This plan seemed like it had so many holes in it, but at the end of the day, within a generation, God was the official God of Israel again. Listen, God is so much bigger than we give him credit for, and let me just encourage somebody real quick before November gets here. If the person you want to be elected is elected, that's awesome. The Lord, don't let him throw stones, but... If the person you don't want to be elected is not elected, it's going to be okay. Why? Because from the earliest times, we could see regardless of who's in office, we know who's on the throne. God is so much bigger <laughs> than we give him credit for. Listen, God is bigger than we give him credit for. He's smarter than, he get, than we give him credit for. And he has a will. And because it is his will, it will be accomplished, even if it's not in our way. Even if it's not in a way we understand. He has always been working in and through people that might not even know they're part of God's plan. But his will, his word, it's not going to return to him void, the Bible says. It just might not be our way. So sometimes we might have to take a step back and be like, God, I really don't understand, but what I do know is when I read that, I see you're sovereign. When I read that, I see you're working over things. When I read that, I see that I'm going to be all right as long as I hold fast to your sovereignty. Elijah had to learn that. And I really feel like somebody needs to know God's working even though you don't think that he is. In your life, like, you might be discouraged, and you might not see how. With everything you've had to go through, how is God working? Let me just remind you, he's the God of greatness who will come in a manger. He's the God who could have saved the world by snapping his fingers in an instant. But he'll choose to do it by sending his son. God's will is great. His ways are sometimes confusing. But when we confine God's will to our ways, we will have an unhealthy heart. Elijah had to learn this, and we got to learn it too. Amen? We serve a sovereign God. He's on the throne. We're going to be all right. So how, so far, do we experience heart change? Well, number one, we have to have a holistic view of life. Number two, we got to hold on to God's sovereignty. But now let's get to the climax of the passage. Because the truth is, everything is really building up to the part we're about to study. Everything is really building up to this. This is the core of how God changes Elijah's heart. In verse 9, we see that Elijah, Elijah has hidden himself in a cave. And in verse 11, God tells him to go stand out in the cave because God is about to reveal himself to Elijah. Verse 11 picks up. It says, go out and stand before me on the mountain. The Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by, and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. 
It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose. Everybody say torn loose. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. After the earthquake, there was a fire. The Lord wasn't in the fire. And after the fire, there was a sound of a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. All right. Kind of weird, right? Like, all right, cool. What do I get from that? We can't help but read that and be like, God, what are you trying to say through all of this? Well, we've been saying hype can't change your heart. And God's trying to prove this. He sent the big show, man. He sent the earthquake, the wind, and the fire. But the Bible says he's not in any of those. Now, let me be clear. It's not that he is never in any of those. When he leads Israel in the wilderness in Exodus, what does he lead as? A pillar of fire. When he comes to Zechariah, Zechariah 14, what does he come at? Is an earthquake. When he answers Job in Job 38, he answers Job out of the windstorm. The point is not that God is never these things. The point is that God is making to Elijah, who just called down fire and expected everybody's heart to change, is that the crazy, unbelievable, ultimate, that's not the way God normally changes hearts. So what is, right? The climax of the story, what? is what shows us what Elijah had to learn. I'm going to read it, and then I'll explain it and elaborate on it. Number three, we got to learn to hide in the rock and to hear God's word. Let me elaborate. See, God is not in the earthquake, the wind, or the fire, but he is in the gentle whisper. But you can't read this logically without wondering to some extent, wait, 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 how is Elijah alive? (laughs) Like, if if the windstorm, the earthquake, the fire was so bad that it literally tore the rock loose, busted it up how is Elijah standing strong how is he not dead the rock see Elijah hid in the rock until he heard the gentle whisper of God God tells Elijah in verse 11 go stand out on the mountain before me but it is not until verse 13 (laughs) Elijah's smart until after the earthquake wind and fire that Elijah actually goes out of the cave Elijah hid in the rock, and he was called out by the gentle word. What does this mean? Lord, help me say it well. See, the earthquake, the wind, the fire, they're not just ways God's revealed himself. All throughout the Bible, these are signs of God's judgment, of God's wrath. And Elijah hid in the rock that took the punishment of earthquake, wind, and fire so that he could be drawn out to hear the gentle word of God. See, this is all a foreshadow of what's to come, of the day when Jesus Christ, who scripture refers to so many times as the rock, would shield us like that rock shielded Elijah, taking our punishment, our shame, our guilt, so that we could be drawn out to the gentle word of God. Elijah's so mad that God didn't change people's heart through all the hypes and the signs and the wonders in the show. And God implicitly has to show him, Elijah, it doesn't matter what I do. It doesn't matter how many miracles I send. It doesn't matter how much hype I brought. Nothing matters until you realize you were the one that deserved the punishment. But you got to hide in the rock, Jesus Christ, who took all the punishment you'd ever deserve, took all the shame you'd ever add up for yourself so that you could be brought gently into my presence only only when a heart realizes that only when a heart realizes God I know where I am without you God I know who I am before you came into my life God I know that if it was up to me and I was left up to be judged by my own works I would deserve nothing but punishment I would deserve nothing but the earthquake wind and fire but I'm thankful that I serve a God that didn't come to bring my punishment he came to bear my punishment so that on his back I would be set free so that on his back his stripes I could know listen my grandpa he used to say people miss the gospel by six inches because we know about it here, but until it's real to you here, it can't melt your heart. You wanna know how God changes lives? It's when at the same second, we can see I really am the biggest object of God's judgment. But at the same time, I'm the biggest object of his grace. And when you realize that, when you realize 
that God set you free. That you really, Jesus didn't just die for you, he died in your place. He died in my place. It should have been me up there. When you realize that he gave that so that you could go free and hear the gentleness of his word, that's the only thing, the only thing, the only thing, the only thing that'll ever melt a heart of stone. That's why we sing, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin is left a crimson stain. He washed it white as well. I messed it up. The part before that says, can change the leper's spot and melt a heart of stone. Maybe you think I'm implying too much from the scripture. Let me say it a different way real quick. In Luke 16, Jesus say, says the very same thing explicitly that Elijah in this story is saying implicitly. Jesus tells this story about a rich man and Lazarus. And the rich man and Lazarus, they die. The rich man goes to hell. Lazarus goes to heaven. And Abraham is kind of mediating between them. And the rich man says, Father Abraham, can you send Lazarus back from the dead to warn my brothers about this terrible fate in hell? Because I don't want them to experience this same thing and Abraham says to him well they have Moses and the prophets in other words they have the scriptures they can read that but the man protests and he says no father Abraham you don't understand if they could see a man come back from the dead if they could see the hype if they could see the show that'll change their heart and Abraham says unless they read the scriptures nothing will change their heart how radical is that statement do we really believe that? A lot of people, they, they really struggle to hear God's voice. Man, read his word. My dad always says, you want to know God? Read God. The law and the prophets, as early as Elijah, have showed us that we deserve judgment. But through Christ, we get grace. Has your heart been softened? As God shows you that he loves you so much that he took the punishment you deserve, took the punishment I deserved. Only when that moves from here to here can a heart melt. Only when that happens can serving God be something that you have to do to something you are honored that you get to do because you know you're nothing apart from him anyway. That moves beyond hype. That moves into true humility. But the kingdom of God is backwards because in humility, there's our hope. Today I'm speaking on behalf of Family Ministries, and I brought a message, but we also brought a plan. Let me tell you this Back to School Sunday, how we want to help your family experience heart change through the Word of God. We understand that reading the Word of God, much less trying to teach it to your kids, that can be intimidating. But we can't ignore it just because it's intimidating. See, I could teach your kids the Word until I am blue in the face here at church, but there's no place like home. Kids get discipled and should get discipled at the home as well. Jesus said, or not Jesus, the Bible says in Deuteronomy 11, God tells parents, fix these words of mine in your heart and mind. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your forehead. Teach them to your children, talking about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. That's God's word to you. The church can't do that, but man, we definitely want to help you do that. So today, we're launching something called the bridge. The point is that we want to bridge the gap between your house and God's house. Essentially what this is, let me tell you, it's a, our family's ministries teams from kids to, you know, youth, I guess young adults, I don't know. Um, we work really hard so that we could supply you with about three texts a week. And all the texts have a very, very, very important pur purpose. One of the texts is going to be a guided devotional. We understand it can be hard to read the Bible, figure out how to talk about it. So it fits on a little graphic, just has a picture, a reference, and a couple questions that make it so easy for you to ask your kids, talk about it, chew on the Word of God together, and really grow. That's one of the texts every week. We'll give you the opportunity to do that. Another one is a text called Table Talk. Basically, this is a text that, just a question that helps you. You can ask your family something that gives you a chance to connect culturally, because life's holistic. We got to connect holistically, and plus, Gen Z, their culture, love you guys. It's a little weird. I didn't expect for you guys to know it completely, but uh, we want to help you connect holistically. And then there's another text or two we may or may not send. We don't want to overload you. At the end of the day, there's a video that explains this better than me. So watch Digital Me and Tony. Hey parents, Pastor Tony and Pastor G here. We know how important church is, but we also know there's no place like home. And how we help you teach your kid to know God at home is so important. 
But we know helping your kids get closer to God can feel intimidating and overwhelming. So over the last several months, we as a family ministry team have been praying, planning, and preparing for ways to help you do this. And as a result, we are thrilled to launch The Bridge. Now, The Bridge is a simple way to bridge the gap between the church and home. It helps your family grow closer to God and be more connected to each other. Here's what it'll look like. Over the course of the week, you'll get three, maybe four texts to your phone. One is a guided devotional that makes it easy to explore God's word with your kids. Another text is what we call table talk. This one will help you connect culturally with your kids. So you can finally know like what is a TikTok <laughs> and why is my phone bill so high? We'll also send little midweek motivations to keep you laughing and every now and then update you on any important news about our family ministries. This is a completely free resource for every parent within FFC. We want to help you even at the house, and don't worry, we aren't going to blow up your phone. Is this the Krusty Krab? No! This is Patrick! So, subscribe to The Bridge today by texting FFC Fam to the number below. And let's begin strengthening the connection between God's house and yours. Thanks for trusting us as influences in your kids' lives. We truly believe our best days are ahead. Yes! I, uh... I hope that you give this a try. I hope you walk it out for a year. I hope you give this as much effort as getting your kids to practice because it's just as important. If you didn't get the text, um, there's cards that we've made. Emma did a great job making these cards that give you all the information. They have the number you can text. They're at the lobbies. You can grab those. Um, but we care about your family wholeheartedly, and I really believe this next generation is going to come to know God in a very real way to them. In fact, I want to pray over them. If you don't mind, bow your head and close your eyes. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for these kids. God, would you help them come to know you more each day? Would you help them know the abundant life you bring? Would you help them walk in boldness and walk in authority of a child of God? And Lord, convince their heart that they've been hidden in the rock, that you took everything they deserve so they could have the still small voice, God, that we can read in your word. Let them grow up to know the word and never depart from it, in Jesus' name. I want to stay in an attitude of prayer before we leave today. There may be people in this room or online that say, you know, Pastor G, I'm not even sure where I stand with God. But at some point during this service, I could really feel God tugging on my heart. And I realized that, yes, I am a sinner, just like everybody else who's in need of a Savior. And today, I want to know, without a shadow of a doubt, that if I stood in God's presence, he would see Jesus because I've accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. If you're in here today and you want to make Jesus the Lord and Savior of your life, I'm not going to embarrass you, not going to make you stand up, come here. But on the count of three, I just want you to wave your hand at me. One, two, three. Awesome. Awesome. Say today I want to make Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of my life. I see that hand up there. That's awesome. Now maybe you're in here. And you say, you know, Pastor G, the truth is, at one point I was a believer, but I've just kind of not been living right. I've been doing things my own way. I haven't followed God's way. I haven't trusted what he says. But today I really want to start a new chapter. I really want to try to go full force ahead and rededicate my life to Christ. If anybody's in here and you say, I know that I'm supposed to rededicate my life to Christ today. On the count of three, wherever you're at, I just want you to wave your hand at me. One, two, three. Awesome. I see those hands. See those hands. Great. That's amazing. That's amazing. Well, do me a favor. Would you put your hand on your heart and look up? Repeat after me. Heavenly Father, I know I'm a sinner, but I know you're a Savior. Thank you for loving me when I didn't think about you. Thanks for running me down when I was running away. I give my life to you. Help me follow you. If I fall, give me the grace to get back up. Put people in my path who will bring me to you. Thanks for taking my punishment so I could have your gentle word. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Well, Faith Family, thank you so much for coming to this Back to School Sunday. We love you guys. We believe the best days are ahead. Amen. Hey, can we give Pastor G a big hand? Yeah.
Let's thank him for working so hard to feed us so well this morning. Amen. I got to tell you that that message spoke deeply to me on a bunch of fronts. But mostly because Acts chapter 2 says that those of us on the senior side of life, you don't have to admit it, but your kids will tell you you are, all right? It tells us that the senior side of life should be the most spirit-filled side of life that we've ever lived. And it tells us that God's role for us is to live with vision. And he wants us to have vision. And the vision he wants us to have is to bring forth the dreams that he's putting on the inside of the next generation's heart. And when you have young people who are living consecrated and close to the Holy Spirit, how many of you know you can get pretty fired up about doing that, can't you? It's not my role to preach today, so I'm done. You just heard a great sermon but it, it's my role to uh, give everybody opportunity to bring our tithes and offerings to the Lord for his work. And as we do it, I'm not going to share a scripture with you this morning. I'm not going to even talk about a story of things that God's doing through our giving this morning. But I want to share an important initiative that we're beginning today. You know, a few weeks back, I was praying for our church family. And this impression came into my heart that a lot of us are talking to God about things that he wants us to turn our hearts to him so that he can turn what we're talking to him about into the blessing that he's dreaming about bringing into our lives. And this scripture came into my heart. It's in 2 Chronicles 16, 9. The eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen. Everybody say strengthen. Another version says in order to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are fully committed to him. And then the prophet Hannah and I said to Asa the king, but what a fool you've been. From now on, you're going to be at war. And the scripture teaches us that basically the difference between winning our war and living in our war constantly is learning how to turn our hearts to the Lord. And so beginning tomorrow morning, Tamara and I for 21 days are going to train our church in how to turn our hearts to the Lord. We're going to share with you an eight-step process that will help you turn your heart to the Lord. So the things that you're talking to the Lord about, you can see the Lord begin to turn that battle in your life. And, uh, you know, in our country right now, we're, we're in a time of spiritual warfare. And I know because of that, I'm in the midst of things as a husband, as a father, as a pastor, as a friend, as a brother. The enemy's fighting on lots of fronts. And I know that day that the Holy Spirit was saying, I want my church to fight. And I don't just want my kids talking to me about stuff. I want the battle to turn. David said, the moment I cried out to the Lord, the tide of my battle began to turn. How many of you are ready for the tide of your battle to turn because of the things that God's doing? Amen? So I want to let you know how to be a part of that, and then we'll give everybody an opportunity to give to the Lord. It'll be up every day starting tomorrow at 7 o'clock on Facebook, on Instagram. We have a slide prepared for you. you if, if you've never become our friend on Facebook, I hope you do that, or on Instagram. And I'm talking about the church's friend, not my personal friend, but it'll be up on the church. You can be my friend too. You're my friend too. But it'll be up on the church page. And, or what you can do is if you give us your email address, it'll come into your inbox every single morning. That's the way that I do it. And we're real careful, as, as Jeffrey talked about, in terms of how we communicate with the church. We basically send an email a month so people can know everything that's going on in the life of the church. And then we only uh, send another email if, if it's a really special event. So here's what we're going to do as we prepare to give to the Lord. I'll have somebody at each one of the offering boxes as you leave. And if you want to have it arrive in your email inbox, just take the offering envelope in front of you, write down your email, and you can hand your email address to somebody uh, by the offering box as you leave. So anyway, thank you for being an awesome church. How many of you are glad to be a part of a church where people love God with all their heart and they're doing his work well? Amen.
Uh, we do have, I forgot to mention this, we worked really hard on them. If you want more information about the bridge, there's flyers at every lobby. Tells you how to, you know, just sign up for the text. Tells you a little bit about the heart. Please take one. And then also we have voter registration going on in the Connection Center and both lobbies if you'd like to make sure you're registered to vote or just make sure, uh, or just get some more info on that. But anyway, we got two students in the house. We got Miss Emily and Miss Kinley, and they are amazing people. She's going to pray over the offering. She's going to bless us, and then we'll get out of here. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us this chance to give today. Father God, thank you for everything that you are doing in our church. And God, I just pray a blessing over everything that is being given today, God, that it will be used for great works in your kingdom. And God, I pray a blessing over everyone who is giving today, God, with a kind and cheerful heart, God, and that they will just continue to do great works for you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Great job. Hey, we love you guys. Y'all have a great Sunday afternoon.